Now it's time for uh, today's perspective on the programme. And if you hear the phrase uh, artificial intelligence, you might uh, immediately think of the horrors of sci-fi films where the robots turn against the human race. Fiction, of course, being the operative word there. For now, at least, AI being used will mostly in many ways to help the human race, not least with industrial robots, self-driving cars, algorithmic predictions for a star. But it does, of course, remain highly controversial. So let's discuss some of the pros and the cons with author of a new book. It's called Making Sense of AI by Antti Elliott, who's a Dean of External Engagement, Professor of Sociology and Executive Director of the Hawke EU Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence and Network at the University of South Australia. Thanks very much for for being with us on the programme, uh, here on set with us as well, which is very nice today. Um, let's talk about the pros, um, first of all. I mean, what does AI do for us? Well, AI, there's a lot of hype about AI at the moment, and particularly pushed, obviously, by the big tech companies. But it's fair to say that the digital revolution has thoroughly transformed our lives and our lives in these times. It's affected everything from production, consumption, travel, transport, tourism, as well as systems of, you know, leisure and pleasure. So there's not much that it doesn't impinge on. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we get away, as you've just said in your opening comments there, we get away from this notion that AI is only about the future. It's actually about the here and now. And it's transforming how we live our lives, particularly our everyday lives. And it's being used um, a lot, for example, in statistics and algorithms I'm able to do with climate change, to do with fighting pandemics. Let's not forget, of course, the coronavirus pandemic, an awful lot of AI used there. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just think of the speed with which not only uh, it's on both sides of the coin for COVID-19 because um, artificial intelligence was sort of bound up. It's a, glo it's a global system. There are global AI elements in all of this. But at the same time, the speed with which vaccine uh, the search for the vaccine actually happened was partly a result of the use of supercomputers, um, you know, and that really accelerated the speed of the delivery of the of the vaccine rollout from probably six years, crushing it down to about a year. So again, you know, remarkable change, and um, it's the speed of change which is most noticeable here. And I know one of the things you talk about in your book as well talking of that speed of change is, is the, the kind of competition between different countries to kind of, you know, really innovate and, and embrace AI. One of the curious things there is we hear a lot about the kind of exponential change and development of artificial intelligence. That's true only to a point. It's very uneven development. So if you compare what's happening, for example, if you look at national research strategies in this country, in France, or in the UK, you're talking some 1.5 to 2 billion um, pounds being invested into artificial intelligence in the coming years. But that pales in comparison if you look at, say, a re at a regional level. The EU is investing something like 20 billion euros um, in the coming years. But then that too pales in comparison if you compare that to what the United States and China's doing. China's on, you know, its policy commitments are some 200 billion dollars into artificial intelligence between now and 2030. So perhaps little wonder that one industry assessment has it that AI could be worth, could be worth up to $16 trillion to wow. the US economy by 2030. It's a staggering amount, isn't it? it the sure amount is. of, uh, of money mm. investment involved. Let's put my skeptic hat on then. I mean, what, what should we be worried about? Because it's not all a bed of roses, is it? No, it isn't. And uh, one of the things I'm arguing in the book is that you and I, and we're all facing the situation now of a technological tsunami, as I call it, technological tsunami raining down on us. It's not just AI, it's advanced um, automation and robotics and machine learning and big data and the Internet of Things, which, of course, is now fast becoming the Internet of everything. So, you know, the, the dangers here is that I think AI for many people has become a kind of coping mechanism. We use it just to get by in much of our everyday life, whether we, you know, sp uh, Spotify or Netflix or we're using Siri or Alexa. And it's great because it helps us, you know, it's seductive and it's enticing and it means we don't have to miss out on any options. But there's a flip side to this as well, which is in outsourcing our personal decision making, to some extent, we lose control over that decision making. And that's what I try to raise as an issue throughout the book, because it's a really big problem and people are increasingly concerned about this today.
So listening to what you're saying there, that phrase, lose control, I mean, uh, we, I sort of joked at the beginning about, you know, robots taking over the human race, but mm. presumably down the road, maybe not now, but in a, another 50, 100 years, it really is something that, that could be much more alarming and worrying uh, to, to people. Yeah. So within the whole discourse of AI, this talk about, they call it a technological singularity, when non-biological intelligence will outstrip biological intelligence. I'm a little less worried about that, to be honest, because I think it is decades down the road. I think the bigger issue at the moment is that, you know, machine learning algorithms actually don't, um, you know, uh, help us with our anxieties. If anything, they can often add to our anxieties. Uh, and, and we experience in that in so many different aspects of our lives, the more that we keep outsourcing these decisions in order to keep up with the with the, the scramble of a world of continuous change. And of course, the problem at the moment is if something goes wrong in our lives, you know, we, we can blame humans, can't we? But for example, something like a self-drive car, which is becoming more and more prominent with that, it is it is blaming the machine. It's the machine that's at fault. We've got self-driving cars, we've got flying taxis being piloted in Dubai, you've got, um, you know, space rockets and the militarisation of drones. It's, it's no wonder that people are starting to look around saying, hey, you know, what's going on here? There's a fair bit now to be concerned about. And weaponry and surveillance, presumably, are, are two of those major issues. And so often surveillance is thought about only, I mean, obviously in terms of its broader political connotations, but as we're seeing with the debate around many of the big tech companies and the gig economy and work practices and decreasing work standards today, surveillance is now part and parcel of the way in which we live our lives, both in the working environment but at home. Great to talk to you today. Thanks very much for coming in and uh, talking to us. The programme that's uh, Anthony Elliott. Uh, his book is called Making Sense of AI. Thanks very much. Pleasure.